Let's break down this raid and the impeachment story together tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. I normally wouldn't drag uh, our good general in here to talk about the impeachment politics necessarily, but today we have an army twist to this. We have uh, a decorated soldier who is clearly uncomfortable with the president's perfect phone call and is testifying in front of House Intelligence today, uh, mounting pressure for Congress to go public with its process, the Thursday impeachment vote is coming and uh you know it's one of these it's one of these bouts back and forth across partisan aisles where no matter what one side does the other side finds problems with it now that nancy pelosi has said all right listen now that we're going to ratify that we're in an impeachment inquiry with the full vote of the house the republicans suggest that she needs to start from scratch because everything she was doing prior to it is null and void it's all part of the cat and mouse game that's going on but we really haven't had a chance to dig into the uh the nuances and the military perspective on the successful raid and demise of al-Baghdadi, right? So let's do that tonight. Uh, General Centracchio is here. In the meantime, let me just throw up one quick headline. Not a lot going on locally. It's kind of a slow news day in our community. But I see that uh, the Ed Commissioner has finally made an offer to a, a superintendent candidate. Uh, there's a lot of press pressure and, you know, mover shaker pressure on this hire to happen simultaneous with the state formal takeover on November 1st, that's Friday, of the Providence school system. I don't think she has to hurry at all. In fact, I would like to see a new model for superintendents. I would like to see great managers become superintendents of school districts with academic expertise to support them, as opposed to great academicians who end up growing to managerial positions who really are not very well trained for it. Uh, we have a systems problem in, in, in public service and in uh, municipal government. People who have ideas and thoughts about programs and things and how we ought to treat each other and politics, but you know, running the operation, they know Regis and Trachios, you know what I'm saying? And I think, I think we need to think about that. And so I just think the superintendent needs to just relax, just relax uh, ab about this and not get it wrong. Because she actually is the academic superior here. She's the one that's going to lay down the curriculum. And whoever she has to bring in is going to have to abide by it. Because the last thing the new commissioner needs is a renegade superintendent, right? Because they're all greater fools. I say that respectfully. You know, they're all smarter than the next one. Right? Okay. Anyway, we'll see how that goes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, headlines on this you've seen over and over. And here was the latest update because we did have some military um, backup to the story yesterday. His death marks a devastating blow for the remnants of ISIS. The Delta Force that led the raid spent about two hours at al-Baghdadi's compound. And they executed the raid in all of its facets brilliantly. The U.S. came away with cell phones and laptops, which potentially can point the Delta Force in the direction of other ISIS hideouts. How much material did you take away? There was material taken away. I, I don't want to characterize exactly what or how much yet until it gets exploited properly. This is the Delta dog, which chased al-Baghdadi down a dead-end tunnel where he set off his suicide vest, killing himself and three children with him. Five other people were killed in the compound by the Delta Force. Two were captured. There were two uh, adult males taken off the objective, alive, and they're in our custody. Those lieutenants may be able to shed light on what happened to Kayla Mueller, a young aid worker al-Baghdadi had captured and brutalized. The raid was named after Kayla, and her parents spoke on Monday. Until we have her home, we truly don't know what happened to her. His lieutenants have been captured, mm -hmm. and who else would know what happened to Kayla mm -hmm. but these people close to him? We're also learning more about how the U.S. found al-Baghdadi. General Mazloum Abdi of the Syrian Democratic Forces said the Kurds had an informant within al-Baghdadi's inner circle. 
The informant reportedly tracked Al Baghdadi for five months and provided a floor plan of his hideout, including the number of guards and location of tunnels. Can't buy that kind of intel, huh? Tell you, you know, when you, when you talk about um, a plan, a plan takes an awful long time. And you've got to, you have to make sure the intelligence that you're working with is valid and up to date. Uh, this thing started several months ago, as was just uh, talked about. Uh, when you need to depend on whatever your information you're getting, it has to be validated to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trusting the Syrians, we're trusting the Kurds. And of course, the, the United States intelligence uh, agencies are verifying all this before you pull the trigger, so to speak, on any plan. So I think the, the challenge here is to, to understand that a plan and an operation takes a long amount of time to actually put in place. The one that gives the okay is the President of the United States. And I think we need to talk about that capacity. Uh, I don't think we talk enough about uh, the two roles that this president or any president plays. He's the commander in chief. He's also the president of the United States. The commander in chief makes these decisions based upon intelligence and recommendations that he's getting from his joint chiefs of staff, uh, based upon uh, verifiable and credential, uh, credentially uh, validated intelligence from wherever we get it. Uh, and all of the resources that go into the plan must be obviously ready to go. And it needs to be as fluid as you can possibly be. Uh, we also recognize that uh, al-Baghdadi moved quite a bit. And with that, the entire plan had to move with him. Uh, this particular compound that it really ended up at uh, wasn't necessarily where he was a week ago. And so everything moves with his whereabouts. The plan itself uh, started several months ago. The actual execution of the plan was within perhaps several hours of the actual time that it took place. Well, the plan and, and the overall objective are also two different things, right? You can have an objective to take out the leader of ISIS, but the plan to do so is much more specific and intricate. The, 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 the idea that this is a, kind of a new revelation that, that we wanted to get this guy just isn't true. I mean, ever since ISIS was formed and the caliphate was constructed and dismantled, he was still a target of the United States military, correct? Correct. And uh, once again, that, that has always been on the back burner. So it's, let's say back burner. It's always been a priority. But back burner is in reference to the actual operation that would take him out. Uh, we, we also recognize, I think uh, all of us should recognize, that by taking him out, uh, you're only taking out the, the, the signature of a particular organization that does not destroy the organization, and it'll continue to operate. Well, reportedly, and, the second in command uh, yeah. just lost his life, too, so it, 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 I'm not sure whether that happened in the raid itself or post. Yeah. Um, but uh, that they're, they're digging around. Yeah, you, you, you were, without getting into the president's role here in this segment, we will in the next segment, uh, the skill set and, and the, the operational uh, expertise, technology, courage uh, is still unsurpassed worldwide. Absolutely. You know, Delta Force is a composite organization uh, which requires an awful lot of uh, resources, an awful lot of uh, uh, planning within. Uh, ranging from using the United States Air Force, the Army, the Navy, all of our branches are involved in some way of supporting that Delta Force itself. The mission is recognized uh, by uh, direction of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, obviously okayed by the President or the Commander in Chief in this particular case, and they say, okay, do it. Once they do it, then you need to support it with the resources and whatever else it takes to uh, accomplish the mission satisfactorily. So you make sure you have the right leadership. You ensure that you have the resources to uh, satisfy the mission, and you need to be clear on what the mission is. Here, it was clearly, in my opinion, uh, to take out uh, al-Baghdadi. Uh, at the same time, it, the, the secondary mission was to demonstrate that we have the ability to go anywhere in the world on very short notice, because there are always plans in place to be able to accomplish a mission. You were... Um our last visit, you and I were, had a lengthy and delicate conversation about the, the, the president's decision to move troops out of Syria, northern Syria. And since then, we've seen what's happened. We now have 
a, uh, a, you know, a loosely agreed to ceasefire, it seems to me. Um, you talked about it being the right thing to do, but timing was important. And, and you finally, only after I asked the question three or four times, because your diplomacy always leads the day, you, you agreed that timing could be two hours, two days, two months, two years, two decades. It just had to be right. And you agreed that the timing wasn't quite right. Do you think that that move um, accelerated the need to move on al-Baghdadi when they did? There's reporting out there that suggests that um, circumstances were such, you know, the tenuous relationship with the Kurds and, and, and all that's going on caused kind of a, a shorter fuse uh, for this to be able to happen, meaning opportunity may not be there for very long. Do you agree? I, I agree that that's a possibility. I can't certainly uh, add any definitive yes to that. Right. But I would suggest that uh, because we uh, have a strained relationship, as it's observed, with the Kurds, as well as the Syrians, uh, we had to move now because we still have a, a good relationship uh, with those intelligence agencies, being Syria as well as the Kurds and the United States intelligence. I mean, the on the ground relationships yeah. don't don't sever with with one decision by the commander in chief. Right on. Mm -hmm. But they certainly become frayed and complicated, and therefore enters into the credibility of it. Uh, when you're putting troops in harm's way, you need to make make absolutely sure that what you're being told is in fact factual and that you can launch this operation knowing that you're going to achieve your, your end result and accomplishing the mission. If we didn't have that reliance and we didn't have that trust in the, in the Kurds as well as the Syrians, I don't think this operation would have happened. Uh, just to follow up on our last visit, uh, how do you feel about that move in northern Syria now? Well, Notwithstanding yeah. what happened with al-Baghdadi. What do you mean, as far as taking care of the oil fields? Yeah. No, yeah. Well, well, the, the new fluid mission is that we're going to take care of oil fields. Mm -hmm. um, we still green-lighted Turkey. There's no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah. You know, I, And we got Kurds who are completely disenfranchised. Yeah, but I think the leadership understands. And I think uh, if you look at the leadership of the, the, the Kurd the assets there, as well as Syria, they recognize that um, we made that move for several reasons, and that was that the President of the United States, uh, the Commander in Chief in this case, uh, wanted to ensure that we didn't put troops in harm's way and get into a fight between Syria and Turkey and the Kurds. Uh, that would have not been constructive at all. So I think the decision was that we needed to move out and see what unfolded, and we saw what happened. Uh, they did make an exit. There was a, an established uh, border. So uh, a boundary there, so to speak. But we also recognize, and I do believe that the oil fields were part of a conversation in the beginning. That may have been brief. I don't know this to be a fact, but I would think that because you're talking about valuable you assets. You sound like you're supporting the move now. You told me you didn't think no, it was No, 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 I didn't. Yeah, I'm not yeah, saying that. Yeah. I'm saying that it, it happened. I'm not saying that it was legitimately on time, at the right time. I still agree. I still subscribe that it was not the right time. I don't know what the right time could be, but I don't think that was the right time. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, maybe it was. I don't know, but I don't think it was. All right, when we come back, to how the president tells this story next. Stay with us. Last night, the United States brought the world's number one terrorist leader to justice, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is dead. He was the founder and leader of ISIS, the most ruthless and violent terror organization anywhere in the world. U.S. Special Operations Forces executed a dangerous and daring nighttime raid in northwestern Syria and accomplished their mission in grand style. You know, I, I thought Sunday morning, as I was watching this live, and I know, Jonah, you, you watched it live, too, I, I, the whole time I was just kind of praying that he would offer, you know, a written statement, turn and go. And no matter what style, including the whining and crying and whimpering that was in the script, uh, that he would, he would do well. And America would be pleased that he made a decision that we all, con we all have consensus and support on. And then he had a Q&A. And the whole thing, for me, unraveled. How did you see it? I agree with you. Um, I'm not criticizing the President of the United States, but I am criticizing the, uh, how it was delivered. 
I think had he said this operation took place, ISIS leader has been killed, and we need to be concerned about uh, obviously terrorism in the future, and uh, not take any questions. That would have been, and certainly give credit to the the troops that accomplished this. Which he did. He did. He did. But I mean, that, in, that in, his, in his written remarks, I thought he to did turn well the with mic that. off and, and move out. Yeah. Did you have? Uh, do you have any concerns about the tactical strategy, even in the written uh, statement, uh, about the you know whimpering, crying? retreating al-Baghdadi. You know, as a citizen, I got to figure when our special forces are invading a compound that it is not a pretty um, situation and that it kind of speaks for itself. I don't know that I needed to hear all of that, and I wonder what the strategic implication is the, uh, of that is. I have a funny feeling that our military still subscribes to this idea that let your actions speak you know, for themselves for the most part, right? Yeah. And herein lies, I think, the difference between, as we stated at the very beginning, the difference between a commander-in-chief and a president of the United States. The commander-in-chief would say, look, this operation was successful. Great credit goes to the special ops people, Delta Force, and all that participated. The leader of ISIS is dead, and uh, thank you very much. However, it went to the other extreme where you get into the presidency now and you get into the political aspects of it. In my opinion, once again, um, trying to uh, establish how this took down the greatest individual in ISIS and that he went out as a coward, I too subscribe that that was not necessary. Um, I think... Um, is, it, is it hurtful? I, I think it... I, you know, it, it certainly hurt, from my opinion, to the uh, the military operation as far as the Joint Chiefs of Staff are concerned. They're there professional to be able to do the mission, accomplish the mission, and move away. To get into the detail about um, the whimpering and whining and stuff is not part of any operation. I've never ever seen that. And you can see with the follow-up with the yeah. Defense Secretary and, and, and the Joint Chiefs, this, the press release yesterday, the uh, press conference yesterday that we, that we played earlier, um, they have none, they're not having any of that nonsense. In fact, they're not even confirming that they specifically heard this kind of play-by-play -play of whimpering and crying and, you know, uh, that the president must have spoken to the units, meaning that he was on the horn, you know, during the operation as it was happening, hearing that kind of stuff. Um, it just seems to me that this president uh, is his own worst enemy. In, in some ways, he, he, he literally ripped not the entire dignity and success of the operation, but a portion of it away f from the country. You know, I, it's a very hard thing to uh, discuss. I, I, I am in the habit of obviously backing uh, the President of the United States and the Commander-in-Chief, uh, and I'm not here to criticize him or anyone else in that position. But I do believe that a military operation has no room in it for any kind of uh, addendum or enhancement uh, beyond the mission of what they did. And so consequently, I hope I've answered that question. Yeah. No, I, I get it. I, I think you have, and I, I get that we should move on. And I'd like to, because we have an Army official who is a, a very important player now in the impeachment conversation. We'll talk about that next. Kind of a new player in the testimony and impeachment. Here's what we had this morning. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman arrived on Capitol Hill to testify. He raised concerns to White House lawyers about the Trump administration's Ukraine policies. As director of European affairs for the National Security Council, Vindman listened to the July phone call where President Trump asked Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to begin political investigations. According to prepared testimony, Vindman said he was concerned by the call, adding, I did not think it was proper to demand that a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen. He went on to say such an investigation would undermine U.S. national security. I had a great conversation with the Ukrainian president. President Trump dismissed Vindman's testimony on Twitter, writing, the Ukraine call concerned today's never Trump or witness. Was he on the same call that I was? Can't be possible. Were you pressured not to testify? Vindman says he also went to White House lawyers after witnessing EU Ambassador Gordon Sondland telling Ukrainian officials that without the investigations, there would be no meeting between Presidents Trump and Zelensky. Vindman's testimony comes as Democrats plan to hold their first House vote to formalize the impeachment inquiry later this week. We will follow the facts. We will apply the law. We will be guided by 
the United States Constitution. In a letter to her colleagues, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi wrote the vote should eliminate any doubt as to whether the Trump administration may withhold documents, prevent witness testimony, or continue obstructing the House of Representatives. They realize this process is, is completely unfair, completely partisan, and they're going to try to spruce it up a little bit. Republicans say they expect every GOP member to vote against the resolution. Uh, the politics of the impeachment process aside for a second, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Vinman is a decorated soldier. And his statement, which I read thoroughly this morning a couple of times to make sure I didn't miss anything, is pretty basic in terms of what his concern was, both pre the call and during the call. Uh, he's been vilified in the last 24-hour news cycle for all sorts of things, including perhaps being a spy because reportedly he was helping with some translation issues with the Ukrainians on, on some matters. Um, what's happened to this country that our default position for you know, an outstanding army soldier isn't to trust him first? I, I think it has to do with where we have come as a society. Uh, within the military, however, I think that trust still exists. Uh, when you take it beyond the military, there's always the political application as to what someone said, and they're going to try to uh, apply it to whatever you think. Are you offended uh, about the way he's been treated in this pregame show for his testimony? Yes, I am. Yeah, I am. When someone comes forward and they have a concern, they bring it forward. Um, you know that when you do that, there's going to be some pushback. Uh, and I recognize that the, the channel that he should do is the one he took. Uh, now, when that gets outside the, the chain of command, and that's a different story. And it migrates to something else. But if you follow the, the procedure, and that is you have a complaint, you have an observation, you take it to the, through the chain of command, which he did. And I think uh, once that happens and he gets looked in a different way by the, either the media or a, uh, an opposing uh, political party, if you will, then that's where it gets a little sticky. Well, look, uh, he's going he's to get whacked around a little bit, but I think the wear and tear on, on the defense the president is offering here uh, is worse with, 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 an, with an army success story like yeah. this, right, mm -hmm. who's yeah. saying what he has to say. Uh, I only have 30 seconds. Do you, you have any thought on the impeachment process right now? I don't want to drag you into a big analysis on no, it, but I, I only have I 30 don't, seconds. I, I, I know that if they follow the Constitution and they do it uh, in the process they are now, which is to have the House take a full vote to vote it that way, that seems to be the way it should yeah, go. Well, the judge said they don't need a full vote. The, the, um, the full vote is part of the politics. Yeah, now. once again, that's somebody's opinion, I guess. I'm not sure. <sighs> what a time, right? It Thank is. you for your expertise on the important stuff. Final word when we come back. All righty. So we'll uh, keep tabs on this important testimony on the impeachment process and uh, check into some of the local issues that are, that are happening, some interesting stories in the Rhode Island State Police uh, and other matters over the course of the week. We'll talk to you at 3 until 6 on WPRO tomorrow afternoon and back here tomorrow night. Thanks so much for tuning in. Good night.